Welcome to another episode of the Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Medicine podcast. And um, we're again recording the podcast uh, virtually this time instead of in person at the Society of Nuclear Medicine meeting. Um, and uh, we've got a, um, a, a, a researcher from Wisconsin, uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and, uh, and so we're going to be recording this, this, this virtually. Um, it's uh, uh, Dr. Zach Rosenkrantz, and he's going to um, tell us a little bit about himself and uh, about the research he's been doing. So over to you, Zach. Yeah, thank you for that introduction. So, so I'm actually still a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I'm advised by Dr. Weibo Kai, um, and I'm part of the Pharmaceutical Sciences Program. Um, so at the SNMI meeting, I gave two talks talking about some recent uh, treatments we developed for stroke. Um, and um, both of those are going to be based on uh, different nanomaterials that we developed. Well, I think that's very interesting. I mean, uh, um, the, we often talk about theranostics or way of evaluating things, but strokes a very uh, serious disease and a very common disease and a very common cause of death and neurodegeneration. I think it's great that we can get into that space and working on that. So why don't you tell us a bit about um, those therapies and, and how, um, how PET played a role in, 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 in developing those. So these are in, in mouse models, right? So. Yeah. So, th well, so this was done using rats. Yeah. Uh, so both, both of the therapies were kind of, rooted in the idea of developing, uh, you know, antioxidant based therapies. So when, uh, you know, in 85% of cases, it's there a specific type of stroke called ischemic stroke. Um, and in the course of this disease, it's going to generate uh, a lot of toxic, what are called reactive oxygen species or ROS. Right. And so, so when you reap, when, when, when someone's recovering from a stroke, the the actual increase of blood flow in the return phase increases oxidation and and uh, causes damage in in itself. So so the reperfusion, if you like, um, correct of the stroke is actually causing the problem. It's not the it's not a, well ischemia is certainly causing a problem, but also the reperfusion. So it's different to a normal stroke, which is a hemorrhagic or uh, the hemorrhagic stroke where the bleeding causes the problem. It's ischemia followed by the the reperfusion. The reperfusion, yeah, yeah that's exactly right. That, that reperfusion is bringing all of the those toxic ROS, like I said, to the uh, the site of the injury, and then causing the tissue damage. Right. Um, so yeah, so that was that was really kind of what our rationale is. We've been you know investigating different nano antioxidants um, and different disease models, and uh, you know we're really wanting to compare how these, you know, nanomaterials really compare the nanomaterials with you know, more traditional small molecules. Right. Um, what, what nanomaterials did you use and, and, and what therapies did you use? What other therapies did you use? Yeah, so, so in this study, we used two different uh, nanomaterials. So the first is uh, polyoxometallate nanoclusters, or POM. Um, so these are going to be self-assembled um, basically self-assembled coordinated metal ions and because because of its unique composition it includes an incorporated molybdenum and so this is going to allow it to be reversibly reduced and oxidized uh you know able to combat that oxidative stress which is the excess ROS and then uh so that sort of then, sort of acts to mop up the oxidation it it acts as a sink for the oxidation. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. So, so basically, we're going to, you know, this highly reactive nanomaterial would just react and kind of neutralize the ROS. Right. And then, uh, so the other one is kind of related, but we kind of added another little twist on it. So uh, this, we're using what's called a, a DNA uh, framework, uh, framework nucleic acid. Uh, so these are basically structures that can be designed into um, you know, really an infinite possibility of shapes. Uh, but, uh, sorry, so 
because DNA is incorporated, uh, DNA can also act as an antioxidant. So uh, it's pretty widely known that DNA can be damaged by ROS. It's kind of, uh, you know, the fundamental behind uh, radiation therapy. Uh, and so what we've done is kind of take that concept and uh, reverse engineer it in a sense and use that to our, our advantage. So it's going to attack, uh, attack the DNA you've injected, not the DNA in the... In, in the uh, in right. So this, is, sorry, so this is external DNA that we would inject that would act similar to POM where we're just neutralizing the ROS. Um, and then we, we also added an additional component to it, we added a, a special type of aptamer. So these are uh, like DNA-based antibodies in a sense, right. um, capable of binding to you know, specific targets. Um, and so this was, we're trying to, um, we're trying to limit the inflammation, side effects of inflammation, uh, which is important because in, uh, you know, the pathogenesis of stroke, the ROS and inflammation are really highly intertwined and you kind of have this, you know, feedback cycle where it's going to, you know, amplify the damage. Right. So we have two different, you know, one of the more simple or antioxidant approach and more of a sort of multifunctional approach. Right. So where does the pet come in? Yeah. So, um, that's kind of the basis for the therapy. So PET is, you know, an, an extremely valuable tool where we're able to, you know, visualize our material after it's been injected. So because of the unique, you know, barriers involved in the brain, we had to do a intrathecal injection. So we injected into the back of the spine. Um, and, uh, basically, from the pet, we we saw what we would you know more or less expect, where we have most of the you know structure nanomaterial confined to the central nervous system. Right, and and you did it intrathecally because the blood brain barrier is going to prevent it getting in any other way, right? Yeah, exactly. So um, yeah, basically, none of the nanomaterial will really enter the brain because of the BBB. Right, right. So. Um... Okay, but we've done uh, PET, uh, you know, even going back 20, 30 years, even Spectre has been used where they've injected into thickly. So this isn't, isn't new. I mean, this is, this, right. uh, that, doing it that way is not a, a radical approach. So, so what did you see? Was, did, the, uh, uh, did you see that these um, uh, nanomaterials were engaging the target? That's what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah, so, uh, we see it, we see it in the brain. Um, so we, we certainly, like you said, didn't, you know, see any, we really didn't see any, you know, anything we didn't expect from the PET images. Um, but we, we do from the therapy studies, we see, you know, depletion of things that are relevant to, you know, biomarkers that are relevant to oxidative stress or inflammation. Um, and then, uh, we also see, you know, other, you know, tissue staining, uh, basically suggesting that we had limited any damage to, uh, the, the brain tissue. Right. And, and so you induced the, you, you gave the rats a stroke by, uh, by, uh, damaging the vasculature and then you. Uh, then you re then you gave the antioxidants and reperfused, or did you did you reperfuse yeah, so, the antioxidants? <laughs> right. So that yeah. So to induce a stroke, it's a it's a surgical model. Um, basically, you introduce a filament into the uh, carotid artery, um, and you're going to basically occlude um, that artery for about an hour, and then. Uh, Immediately, you're going to, you know, basically finish the surgery, introduce root perfusion, and we immediately intrathecally injected the, the two different nanomaterials. Right, right. So, well, firstly, how successful, I presume you did this compared to a sham or, or whatever, how, how successful right. did you 
did, what were the treatments for, for dealing with the stroke? Um, yeah, so we saw uh, really remarkable success. So, Have you got uh, a slide that perhaps you could show us that? that uh, uh, yeah, should I just share my screen? Sure. Yeah, so here is the So here you can see this is uh, it's called TTC staining. Um, so basically all this white tissue is not uh, metabolically active. Right. Um, so, so basically you can see basically in PBS treatment, you're, it's just a, really a lot of dead tissue compared to the palm treatment here. Yep. Um, and then all we also confirm this with MRI images. Yep. And then here's the different markers for oxidative stress. Uh, so we have um, we have sustained levels of superoxide dismutase and palm treatment and lower levels of MDA, which is for lipid peroxidation. Yep. And then also for uh, less apoptosis. Yep. And then you know, pretty similar results here. Uh, we're here for using a sham group, uh, PBS treatment, the aptamer only treatment. And here was kind of an interesting aspect where we were able to compare just the antioxidant therapy yep. and this multifunctional approach. Um, basically, we found that the, the aptamer uh, framework nucleic acid worked the best. Okay. Um, and pretty drastically, we're, we're seeing... Um, you know, the mouse, the behavior of the mice was comparable to the a sham group. Um, and the different biomarkers were also. Uh, That's a pretty dramatic. Can we, can we, the, and the PET scan? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so, yeah, so here's the PET scan. So, uh, like we said, this is after intrathecal injection. Um, so. Um, okay, and you're using zirconium, which has got a. A fairly long half-life, hasn't it? So it's yep. So it's got about three-day half-life, um, and this was we used deferoxamine as a chelator, right? Um, and you see that a lot of this has been uh, eliminated after nine hours. So, um, and then yeah. So then we also compared you know, the different distribution within the brain. Um, and basically we found that it was pretty well distributed. Right. And it's, and it's distributed in the sites of, uh, of occlusion. Sorry, say that again. It's, it's distributed in the sites of action. Uh, 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 right. Yeah. So, um, you can see where the, where the, where the, um, and, yeah. So here's a, uh, some nice images of the overall, but, distribution in the brain. Um, and this is done ex vivo in a brain, but you can see it's um, you know, pretty ubiquitously distributed throughout the brain and um, in this specific site of damage for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very dramatic and very dramatic effects on the therapy. Um, so where do you go next? Um, how do you get, how do you turn this out from the valley of death? How do you get this into humans? And right. So, what have you got to do uh, first? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I guess I can stop sharing my screen. Um, so, this was kind of just an initial verification of the therapy, where you know we're injecting it immediately after this damage from a stroke, right? And it's a very controlled situation where with not very likely to occur in any you know patient in real life to get treatment that quickly. Um, so one of the things we want to do is kind of extend that period from surgery to injection and see, you know, what, you know, what kind of a time frame we can work with. Right. Um, and then also, like you had kind of mentioned, the uh, reperfusion. Uh, so reperfusion agents are also really important in stroke therapy. Um, and ideally, a therapy would 
you know, kind of work in tandem where you're having this antioxidant based therapy with the reperfusion agent. Um, right. So studies working to, you know, combine or to look at the combination of those two. Right. Cause it's now pretty standard for stroke for people to get a, um, um, a, a, a reperfusion agent, a, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, anticoagulant to basically um, basically uh, help uh, break down the, the the ischemia, but at the same time right. you're risking damage. So so you could probably give them perhaps simultaneously. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it's you know obviously really important to you know if this were to go into humans, you know what time of what ability as far as timing we can work with really right um so you're going to have you got a program to try that out in in, in your rats um yeah so uh we'll i think we're planning to to take a look at that um uh and of course it'll come down to funding um but yeah, that's it's definitely something we want to take a look at and you know explore. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, um, um, that'll be exciting. Um, and so you really need to explore that before you even think about getting it into humans, right? Yeah, definitely. Do, can you see any other problems um, in terms of toxicity, um, reactions, things like that uh, with these compounds? Yeah, usually, usually with nanomaterials, toxicity is the number one concern. Um, the a nice thing about these materials is they're, you know, they were therapeutic with really pretty low doses, you know, tens of micrograms. Um, so definitely, you know, in you know more in detail toxicity studies, um, especially with the palm, whereas DNA, you would you know, you'd think it would be less likely to have, you know, toxicity associated with it because it's just DNA. Um, but yeah, definitely toxicity is always a concern. I, I guess one thing, by combining with the PET scanning, uh, even in the humans, you, it would give you an ability to um, uh, to monitor that the uh, on that to see that the the, the therapy hasn't got uh, uh, has got got where it's needed to. It hasn't got core in the spine or whatever you're going to do in terms of in terms of the injection or that it hasn't accumulated somewhere unexpectedly and it might also show other additional sites of stroke at the same time so you've got a bit of a double whammy there do you think right yeah definitely that's a that's a good point and um yeah definitely with i mean from the pets kind of like we saw it at nine hours really a lot of the activity has been eliminated so you know that does kind of qualm a lot of those toxicity concerns right yeah excellent so um so that's really exciting work i think we need to do uh more in terms of stroke uh, because it's such a common disease but it's and it's quite common because people are living older so it's it's often a disease of right. elderly people people are living longer so um so strokes becoming um a big risk and it, you know, and it's important, particularly in places like Japan, for example, where strokes are very serious, a uh, uh, very common cause of death in Japan, for example. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Excellent. Have you got any interest from uh, from drug companies? Uh, so <laughs> we have we have not. So uh, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, no. Um, so we we don't have any intellectual property on the material. So uh, always a concern with. You know, drunk companies. Sure, sure. Oh well, um, maybe, uh, maybe you can do with this. Maybe it's so. So, uh, is there any intellectual property around the material? I mean, is there? Uh, is that material? Uh, per, can people open source and study this? Um, yeah. So, <clears throat> the the palm material is, you know, it's been published in the literature a few times. Um, definitely, people could work with it. Uh, We've worked with it in other disease states, so in a certain type of kidney disease that's also related to ROS. Um, kind of this is a progression of that work. Um, and the, the DNA nanomaterials, um, yeah, I'm not quite sure how the patent stuff works with that, given the, you know, the, 
the fact that you can just change the shape and right. um, you know so so with that type of material it's certainly more complicated right um, but those are other those materials that have been published um, definitely that people can work with if they're interested excellent well I, I guess I guess part of uh, part of generalizing it is to work with other partners in terms of this research too particularly uh, Particularly, it'd be difficult to do the research on humans in in places where there's high COVID at the moment, because um, because you've got uh, because you've got restrictions around uh, uh, around either your control or your other arm. It's going to be difficult to actually actually work out what's going on. But but no problem with 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 rats. I assume we could still get on and do do work along those. Right. Things. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Well, that's really interesting. Anything else you'd like to add that I've missed out on, or that you've missed out on? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Um, All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, I appreciate you giving up your valuable time, particularly on the <laughs> opposite time zones. Um, it's it's, uh, it's uh, morning here in Australia, and uh, I presume it's uh, evening over there. Yeah, just about dinner time. <laughs> so, yeah, it's challenging with these time zones, uh, particularly from Australia, because they always hold meetings in the middle of our night. <laughs> um, yeah, no, this is this is my first experience with uh, you know having to deal with the time zone overseas or whatnot. So it's kind of interesting to deal. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, uh, I I hope I uh, hope things go well for you and um, and um, and stay safe and and good luck with your research. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. You stay safe as well, and uh, thank you for the interest in my work. Yeah.